Hey there, thank you all for coming out today. I'm here to present Miss Kim Nally, who's going to be speaking about uh, Billie Holiday. UC Berkeley History PhD candidate and jazz and blues singer Kim Nally will sketch the life and music of Eleonora Fagan. Awarded most influential African American in the Bay Area and shortlisted for a Grammy, Nally portrayed Holiday on stage in the theatrical biopic Lady Day in Love in 2005, followed with a tribute CD entitled Ballads for Billy, a sold out concert series at Jazz at Lincoln Center in New York, and will reprise her tribute on July 17, 2015 for SF Jazz. As a popular writer, Nally has written for SFGate.com's City Bright series and for Jazz West. As a scholar, she has written several jazz-themed history papers, including This Bitter Earth, Infertility and Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan, and Two Gardenias for Civil Rights, Robin Carson's Portrait of Billie Holiday. Her research of Holiday includes interviews of people who knew Billie personally, painting an intimate singing portrait of the woman whose name is synonymous with jazz singer. So thank you again, and here's Kim. Thank you so much for having me. It is the centennial of the birth of the woman whose name is eponymous with the words jazz singer, Billie Holiday. Her legacy is so ingrained that although she was neither the first nor the last to wear a flower in her hair, a songstress with a flower in her hair will invariably evoke Billie. There is a great triumvirate of vocal jazz, which consists of Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, and Sarah Vaughan. They were the most creatively fertile woman in their field, and the fruits of their creative genius have set the vocal standards so high that no other jazz singer since has come even close to dethroning the memory of their musicianship. Of the three singers, Billie is the eldest, and her career started several, several years before Ella, the second eldest. Unlike the other singers, the sensationalism around Billie Holiday's personal life was legion. Before gossip blogs existed, even before the term paparazzi was coined, the public's interest in the lurid details of Billie Holiday's life dominated and has in many ways diminished her legacy. She did not go to school for music. She did not read or write music, but she is clearly a genius and yet her genius is rarely emphasized. In comparison, there are few biographical sketches that avoid delving into her penchant for abusive men and self-destructive drug use. I recently read a very terrible centennial piece on Holiday that attributed her musical interpretation of, long, of Lover Man, Where Can You Be, to uh, longing for heroin. I do not see the same attention given to Miles Davis's or Charlie Parker's drug use or their abusive relationships. Their women are not given a megaphone to comment on them, and I have never seen their musical genius attributed to drug use. I sometimes see the hardships of being a black man highlighted, but I do not see the same courtesy given to Miss Holiday. So I would like to put her life in historical context. Billie Holiday was born Eleanor Fagan on April 7th, 1915 in Baltimore, but she was raised, uh, excuse me, in, in Philadelphia, but she was raised in Baltimore. Now Baltimore was not a re residentially segregated town in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. Less than 4% of blacks lived in cities, but by the 1900s, thousands of African Americans migrated into cities looking for work, and safety from white redemption, which massacred and terrorized blacks throughout the South after Reconstruction ended. With the influx of African Americans, Baltimore soon became residentially segregated, and the construction of the B&O Railroad displaced several African Americans into already filled slums. Overcrowding and the lack of sanitation in these slums caused an outbreak of typhoid and tuberculosis of epic proportions. One black neighborhood was grimly nicknamed Long Block. Urbanization, industrialization, and depression in Baltimore had concentrated in a growing population of the poor, the sick, and the ignorant. By the 19-teens, the decade of Billie Holiday's birth, several residential ordinances passed by progressives and bolstered by social Darwinist ideology made residential segregation both de facto and du jour. 
Baltimore became such a highly segregated city that in legal studies, it remains the prime city to study to understand the birth of segregation. This was the world that Billie Holiday was born into in 1915. Her neighborhood was called Pigtown. Here is how it was described. Open drains, great lots filled with high weeds, ashes, and garbage accumulated in the alleyways. Cellars filled with filthy black water. Houses that are total strangers to the touch of whitewash or scrubbing brush. Human bodies that have been strangers for months to soap and water. Villainous looking Negroes who loiter and sleep around the street corners and never work. Vile and vicious women with but a smock to cover their black nakedness, lounging in the doorways or squatting upon the steps, hurling foul epithets at every passerby. Foul streets, foul people, and foul tenements filled with foul air. That is Pigtown. Billie Holiday was the offspring of a one night dalliance at a carnival between 16 year old Clarence Halliday and 18 year old Sarah Harris Neefagan who was nicknamed Sadie. The two never married and did not appear to have much of a relationship beyond the night that created baby Eleonora. There is little evidence that Clarence had contact with Sadie and even less evidence of financial support. Jobs for black women were limited and Sadie had difficulty finding work as a live-in maid because white families usually did not allow black children to accompany their live-in domestic maids. As a consequence, Billy intermittently did not live with her mother and was instead shunted around various maternal relatives. The clothing inside of this picture um, were likely secondhand discards from Sadie's employer. On the occasion that she did live with her mother, they, like many poor or African Americans of that time, lived in boarding houses. In 1925, Billy was living with her mother in a Baltimore boarding house when a much older man who was also a boarder at the residence raped her. It was Christmas Eve. Billy was 11 years old. The man was arrested. Billy was placed in protective custody at a reform school called the House of the Good Shepherd for Colored Girls. This reform school is often described as a prison and fallen women were frequently placed there. There are several accounts of abuse and girls running away. Her mother had to hire a lawyer in order to get Billy released. And so Billy Holiday's first brushes with the law as a prepubescent child results in her being locked up even though she was the one that was raped. After a reform school, Billy began to run errands at a place called Alice Dean's. It was not a formal whorehouse, but was rather described as a clip em and let em go joint, where one could smoke reefer, listen to the Victrola, and if they wanted to, they could turn a trick. Most people could not afford a Victrola and the records to play on it, so to be at a place that played records was quite an event. At Alice Dean's, Billie Holiday heard Bessie Smith, the Empress of the Blues. Billie claimed Bessie Smith along with Louis Armstrong, as one of her seminal influences, Billy would later record one of Bessie Smith's famous songs, Tate Nobody's Business If I Do, to her own great acclaim. When Billie Holiday turned 13, Sadie began working at a proper whorehouse called Florence's inside of New York City. She sent for her daughter to come and stay with her. When Billie Holiday arrived, she discovered she was expected to work there as a prostitute. There are no photos of Billie and her mother from this time period. Um, so this photo that you see here is from a later time period. Um, I only can impress upon you in words that Billie Holiday, a very young teenager, was transported across state lines to work as a child sex slave by her mother. We often forget how young 12 and 13 years old is when we speak of African Americans. And even today, the law increasingly treats black and brown children as adults. I encourage people to watch the film Pretty Baby with 12-year-old Brooke Shields so that they can get the full visceral impact of youth forced into prostitution and try to afford the same emotions for Billie Holiday. 
Within months of working at Florence's, Billy was arrested. And although she was one month shy of her 14th birthday, she gave the police a false age of 21, probably to avoid another juvenile home. And consequently, she was convicted as an adult. After doing four months time on Welfare Island, which is now known as Roosevelt Island, she was released in 1929, the beginning of the Great Depression. Billy decided to stop turning tricks and to place her bets on getting a job as an entertainer. She said, I always knew I could sing, I just didn't know I could make money at it. So instead of singing, she auditioned as a dancer at Pods and Jerry's Club. But she danced poorly, and at the suggestion of the audition pianist, she sang a song and was immediately hired. She changed her last name to Holiday in order to capitalize on her father, who by that time was a guitarist in one of the most respected black big bands, the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra. The first name, Billy, is from Billy Dove, a famous actress from that time period known as the American Beauty. This next picture is a photo of Billie Holiday at approximately 16 or 17 years of age. This is the only known photograph of her as a teen or teenager in which she is not working. Billie's fortitude is amazing. She never really had a childhood, yet she turned her rotten lemons into lemonade. She grabbed control of her life at the tender age of 14 years old so that she be could become a professional singer. However, it's very important to not have any illusions about what the jazz life was like back then. There was a prohibition on alcohol in the United States in 1929, and it does not end until 1933. Her gigs were speakeasies run by gangsters who specialized in the transport and sale of illegal bootleg uh, substances. These speakeasies were no jazz at Lincoln Center or San Francisco Jazz Center or any other type of reputable music place. She grew up in a rough world full of hustlers and gangsters. It is small wonder she attached herself to tough men. These were the type of men who could protect her in these types of environments. There was no other option. Women and bands were property that could be passed from one owner to another. There was no choice involved, it was simple necessity. One of Billie Holiday's first regular gigs was singing in Queens for $18 a week. And so you can get an idea of how much money that was back then. You should know that maids got 50 cents a day. Um, this photo over here is not known what year it is, but I think that it is probably also 1935 because she appears to be wearing the same dress that she's wearing outside of the Apollo with Ben Webster. Ram Ramirez, who is the person who wrote Lover Man, Where Can You Be? Johnny Russell. Um, you can see her later in 1939. She seems to be wearing a little better dresses, but they're still not quite fitting very well. <laughs> um, she kept getting fired from her gigs because she wouldn't sing the tune straight. But nonetheless, her originality caught the attention of record producer John Hammond, who arranged her first recording with Benny Goodman Orchestra in 1933. Now it would seem that by the time Billie Holiday made her Apollo debut in 1934, that she was already established having recorded with Benny Goodman, but she wanted to be working in Manhattan, not Queens. Clarence Pop Foster, the MC of the Apollo, said she was a fat slob who wore the same common ugly dress every night. Uh, excuse me, he was the uh, comedian, um, not the MC. However, ugly polka dot dress or not, she competed and won first prize with the song, The Man I Love. After that, she was able to get more gigs inside of Manhattan. She started working at a Mexican place called the Hacha and formed a close bond with her father. This is a picture of Billie Holiday's New York. And it's a great photo because it illustrates how dense the scene is. This fertile jazz scene is a product of segregation and a concentration of talent in a very small radius. They could sit in with each other on set breaks, catch another person's show before or after their show. You can see that over here under the three deuces that Oscar Pettiford is playing. 
And then right down the street, you can see a little bit of it. There's Art Tatum, who's playing. Uh, Pods and Jerry's, where she gets her, her first audition, is right there. And then there's the Onyx, which is a club that she later plays at inside of her career. It is then that she runs into the amazing pianist, Teddy Wilson, and embarks upon a series of recordings for the Brunswick label. Teddy Wilson was just a master of rearranging bargain bin tunes. He and Billy would take tunes and they would be completely unrecognizable and they would have hits with them where nobody else would touch these tunes. It was more like rewriting the songs than, than actually covering them. This next picture is of Lester Young. Billie Holiday was already established inside of New York by the time Lester Young got into Manhattan. And she took him under her wing, and she let him live with her and her mom and got him recording dates. And they had a, a very, very close musical romance. They were not um, physically involved with each other, but they had a very deep, deep, deep special love with each other. He is the person that gave her the name Lady, and she prez for president because he was the top cat in the country. Shortly after, Billie Holiday began playing with the Count Basie Band, which was one of my favorite bands. It was just a very popular jump blues band. During the same period, Ella was singing with the Chick Webb Orchestra. Uh, and so in 1937, when the very famous Battle of the Bands at the Savoy Ballroom happened between Chick Webb and Count Basie, it was also another contest between Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday. Um, there's almost no recordings of this period because Billie Holiday and Count Basie were signed to competing record label contracts. Um, however, the newspapers who covered the event very thoroughly said that Chick Webb kicked Count Basie's band's butt, but Billy won over Ella Fitzgerald hands down. Um, it seems like that this would have been a match made in heaven, Billie Holiday and Count Basie. But unfortunately, Billie Holiday quit Count Basie's band or was fired for not wanting to sing blues tunes. And she joined Artie Shaw's band. Um, if you take a jazz history class now, Artie Shaw is not one of the people you probably study, but I assure you that he was very, very famous, and he was much more famous than Count Basie at that time period. Um, this was her chance to make it big and to be a crossover success. Touring with Artie Shaw on a national level exposed Billy to virulent racism and Jim Crow conditions inside of the South, forcing her to defecate on the side of the road and wait in the kitchen in between tunes and subjected to audiences yelling, let the nigger winch sing another tune. The final straw came when segregation on the radio waves forced the band to replace Billie Holiday's voice with Helen Forrest for an important broadcast. Billie quit and went back to New York to meet her destiny. She started working at a place in the village called the Cafe Society. The Cafe Society was a hip Greenwich Village bar filled with intellectuals, bohemians, and artists. It was there in 1939 that she was introduced to and began performing the song Strange Fruit, an anti-lynching protest song written by Jewish writer Abel Mirapol. This song catapulted Billie Holiday into a new kind of stardom. The owner of Cafe Society was hip enough to not only let her sing the song, but to demand absolute silence. No cash register buttons were pushed. No drink orders were taken. There was no whispering. And he gave her a black room with a tight spotlight on her face. She recorded Strange Fruit on Billy Crystal's uncle's brand new Commodore label because her label, Columbia, wouldn't touch the song. This song and her performances of it at the Cafe Society turned Billie Holiday into a legend. She was no longer the singer of sentimental love songs. She became a race woman, an outspoken proponent of civil rights. More than 15 years before Brown versus Board of Education and almost 20 years before the March on Washington. What is less considered about Strange Fruit 
is the song's communist background. Abe, um, Abel Mirapol was a communist who, like most communists, believed in racial equality. He is also famous for adopting the Rosenberg children, whose parents, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, were executed for passing nuclear information to the Soviets, even though the United States and the USSR were World War II allies at that time. Strange Fruit began as a poem printed in a teacher's union paper under the pseudonym of Lewis Carroll, excuse me, Lewis Allen. The song was printed again inside of the New Masses, a Marxist magazine. How much persecution did Mirapol, a white Jewish man, face that compelled him to publish it under a pseudonym? As opposed to Holiday, a black woman who sang it publicly in person and attached her livelihood to it. It is important not to overlook the fact that communism was active in promoting civil rights and racial equality. The connection between communism and racial equality was so strong that during the McCarthy era, people working for racial equality were similarly labeled communists or at the very least pinkos. There are several accounts of artistic careers ruined during the McCarthy era of the 50s. These are the same, era, the same years that coincided with the last decade of Billie Holiday's life. All in all, Billie Holiday's life spanned 30 years. She recorded from her teens until her death in 1959 at the age of 44. There are very, very few artists, especially vocalists, who can claim a recording career with such length. Shirley Horn, Etta Jones, Jimmy Scott, Alberta Hunter, and many others all fell out of the spotlight for decades before making comebacks. While much to do is made over the changes in Billie Holiday's voice over the decades, any classical vocal student can tell you that a voice, like an athlete, peaks at a certain age and declines despite one's best efforts to preserve it. Billie Holiday's change is often accompanied by accusations of self-destruction. But I myself admire the genius of her later years. It is a study in minimalism and breath control. Her lyricism is resplendent, and the improvisation is so great that the melody at times is unrecognizable from the published sheet music, yet so direct and simple that her improvisation is more melodic than the original melody. Her final studio album, Lady in Satin, was borrowed from my collection and was never returned so often that I purchased it eight times before the digital world re rendered such extended loans impossible. It's never Billie Holiday's early material that's stolen from my collection. It's always the older material. Um, her musical offerings are on pair with John Coltrane and Parker and should be considered as such. So the next time you read an article on Billie Holiday's life, remember that she was a genius who battled virulent uh, segregation, racism, sexism, rape, molestation, and sexual abuse. She was trafficked into child sexual slavery and possibly even sterilized in prison against her will, due to the eugenic politics of her time. And somehow, Holiday took the crap she was given and grew violets for her furs. She truly is one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And now, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So oh, I was going to ask, um, when did you first discover Billie Holiday? And how did your interest grow? Um, she was one of the artists that I listened to growing up inside of my uh, childhood home. And along with Nina Simone and Nancy Wilson, we were fed a, a steady diet of, of them, um, and Ella Fitzgerald. So I can't remember a time where I didn't know them. And then my great uncle was also a jazz drummer who played with Dexter Gordon. So they kind of come from a, a family of musicians for a few generations. What did you think of uh, Diana Ross? <laughs> what did I think about Diana Ross? At the, at the time, I, I, I really disliked it. Um, as a child, they, they just took so many liberties with her story. Um, so what happened with Billie Holiday is uh, she married Louis McKay right before she died because uh, they were arrested for, for drugs. And so they married so that way they wouldn't have to testify against each other inside of court under coverture. 
So it just so happened that when, he, when he, she died, Louis McKay inherited her entire uh, property. And uh, he was a hustler and a pimp, and he decided to spin it so that he was uh, the savior and just, just, you know, he got Billy D. Williams to play himself. But uh, he was absolutely uh, terrible and terrible t to her. So I, I wasn't impressed with it at all, even as a kid. <laughs> um, where do you suggest that we find uh, reliable information if we want to learn more? You know, I was just thinking right before I came here, I was like, I should have had the last slide be a bibliography. Um, so there are, there are a few different books, biographies, that are really great. One of them is by Donald Clark. Um, the other is by Stuart Nicholson. Uh, and those are very basic books that, that probably everybody or anybody has. Um, there's also uh, the autobi her autobiography, Lady Sings the Blues, uh, which is riddled with a lot, a lot of inaccuracies. But at least you, it gives you a step to go into it and, and learn some more. I would say one of my favorite books on Billie Holiday is called On Billie. And it's just a collection of oral histories of first person interviews with people that knew her, including people that played with her when she was 10, 11, 13. And uh, that say the, the quote from Pops Foster, that she was a, a big fat slob with big titties. <laughs> you know, That's what he really thought of her back then. And those are, I think those are really great. Her secretary is included in that. And then beyond that, uh, there's Robert O'Malley, who is a wonderful uh, scholar. He is a English literature. And he wrote a beautiful book on Billie Holiday. And it's a really nice coffee table book. And it has a lot of uh, beautiful photographs that I've never seen before. And, and he is a, you know, an academic scholar. So you know, it's meticulously researched. So it's, it's more than just a coffee table book. But it's really nice. Uh, one is, uh, how did she make transition from the world of prostitution to the world of entertainment? Or did she keep some of the connections with the underworld of uh, prostitution? And the second question is, um, what was her relationship to um, the civil rights movement in the 50s before she passed? Oh, inside of, um, the, she made a very clean break from prostitution into singing um, at the age of 14. And the, the pay scale for singing was such so that, um, that it, it was enough to keep you out of, out of prostitution. She was getting paid more as a, uh, as a jazz singer than she would get as, as a prostitute. So, uh, so that, that's pretty clear. Um, but again, as I mentioned, you might have missed the earlier part, that the world of jazz singing, there was a great amount of overlap. So the people frequenting the clubs during that time period were frequently hustlers and pimps and prostitutes. And, um, and you know, and definitely lots of, you know, white people who wanted to slum it, you know, and, and avid fans and a, a good mix uh, of crowd. Um, just performing at the Cafe Society was a... Uh, civil Rights Act. Um, it was an integrated club, and it was more than just integrated, meaning that the races mixed, but they were actually treated equally, and that was almost not the case in most of the places in Harlem inside of this period. Uh, most of these places had black entertainment for white uh, patrons. Um, but it is a little bit... Um, it, it's hard to talk about her inside of the, inside of the same breath because the, the, what we think of as the modern day civil rights movement is really a 60s kind of thing and she dies in 59. So um, she really predates it and she is just a really early uh, forerunner inside of the civil rights movement, definitely. I was wondering, I know you mentioned Lady in Satin. Uh, I'd love to hear, like, if you're, if you're thinking about listening more of, into her music, uh, collection, what else would you recommend? What are your favorites? What really shows the range? Um, there is a box set by Columbia, and Columbia is the record label that she was on during her early years that really shows 
the range of her voice when, when, she was, when she was younger. And it also has her very first two recordings with uh, Benny Goodman, you know, that nobody would, nobody possibly would know unless you, you, you know, happen to have this, uh, this box set. And her voice is very bell-like and it's, it's very, very, very clear and very high and very girlish. Um, and then I think that most of us are very familiar with the Billie Holiday in the later years where it's, you know, a drawl and almost you can hear all the vocal fry and a voice, you know, it's, that, that's so, so recognizable. But I would get that, that Columbia box set is really, really nice. And again, that has a booklet in it that has a lot of beautiful pictures that you could put on your coffee table. It's not just, uh, uh, it's probably about 11 by 17 liner notes. It's really nice. Yeah. And, uh, thank you, Kim, for speaking to us today. Thanks. <laughs>